All right. Thank you for the introduction. And today I'm going to be talking about wastewater's role in nutrient loading of coastal waters in Mauna Loa Bay. And specifically, I'm focusing on groundwater as kind of the transport mechanism for this nutrient loading. So I'm going to give a quick background on what submarine groundwater discharge is and focus on wastewater disposal systems and specifically on-site disposal systems, which I'm abbreviating as OSDS. And it'll probably be used many times in this talk. So if you forget, just let me know and I'll, I'll mention it again. And then I'm going to highlight major results from my field work events in Montalua Bay in the past year. So what is SGD or submarine groundwater discharge? Well, it's really just groundwater that discharges along the coast. Um, right there, it's recharged at higher elevations typically and due to a hydraulic gradient, it gets kind of pushed out along the coast oftentimes, especially here in Hawaii where we have these really porous lithologies. Um, and groundwater is also a really important mechanism for transporting contaminants from you know, high up or to like lower elevations. Um, specifically, wastewater disposal here on Oahu is served by two primary systems. One would be the more commonly known sewer connection where it goes to a wastewater treatment plant. Um, we have 15 major wastewater treatment plants on Oahu, seven of which dispose of wastewater via ocean outfalls four uh, re-inject that wastewater back once it's treated back underground, and four reclaim the wastewater, typically for irrigation. Um, but what I'm focusing on today are on-site disposal systems and specifically cesspools. Um, if you're not connected to a sewer, you're going to have an on-site disposal system, and cesspools are the most common here on Oahu. And a cesspool is essentially um, just an underground pit. Typically, there's no containing unit. So the waste is free to kind of infiltrate into the unsaturated zone and then thus back, back into groundwater. Um, we do have a few septic systems. Uh, those consist of kind of a containing unit that separates waste into solid and liquids. The liquid kind of gets sloshed off and drains into a leach field for um, some level of treatment. And soil units also allow for a little more treatment than a cesspool. Um, and aerobic units are also a little better than cesspools. But like I said, today's talk is focusing on cesspools. Um, specifically, OSDS in Oahu, or on-site disposal systems on Oahu, you can kind of get a good idea of the density with this map in the upper left, um, the red being the highest density. I think it's over 100 units per square mile. Um, my talk's focusing on Mauna Loa Bay. Uh, but in all of Oahu, there are 14,000 on-site disposal system units. Uh, 11,000 of these are cesspools, so near 80%. And cumulatively, there's around 9 million gallons of effluent discharging per day from these units. Um, more specifically, in my study area, we have, I've separated these, my three coastal sites, Black Point, Wailupe, and Kaveikui, um, based on their watershed delineations, just to get a better idea of what water is serving what site. And Black Point has the highest density of on-site disposal systems. There's around 328. Most of them are focused kind of around that peninsula. And so I think it's around 120 within one kilometer of the groundwater spring I sampled there. Um, and predominantly, they're all cesspools. And that's compared to around 51 total in both the Wailupe and Kawaikui watersheds. So it's a much lower density. Um, and I just want to note here that I also sampled Palolo Tunnel, Ainakoa 1, and Ainakoa 2, which are three terrestrial wells. So I could see the evolution of the geochemistry as you got closer to the coast and, um, and the high OSDS density. Um, again, here are my three coastal sites, Black Point, Wailupe, and Kawaikui. And I did a coastline salinity survey back in April to just kind of confirm that these were indeed the locations where we saw the most groundwater coming out at the coast, and really the only places that we saw a, a large volume of groundwater emanating from the coast. Uh, it may look like these coordinate or overlap with where streams are, but I was there and there was certainly no water coming out of them at the time. 
So this is a better visualization of what the salinity distribution looks like at Black Point, for example. We have the springs close to the shore and thus you get this, this salinity gradient as you go out and mix with marine water. There are also a little, there's a little bit of a seepage face on that left side of the shore too, but it's not as prominent as the, we call it the main boil right there. Uh, for Wailupe, we see the same trend. There's a groundwater seepage face that kind of goes along that whole coast and just slowly and diffusely leaks groundwater, especially at low tide. Um, but there are a few main locations, primarily right in this area. Um, and salinities reach, you know, as low as one. And it's, it's also a big salinity plume. It's about 150 meters out. So when we did these salinity surveys, we also took measurements for nitrate. And um, nitrate's really important for coastal ecosystems. It's biologically limiting. So um, productivity in the ocean depends on it. So when you get these high levels in a place like Hawaii where the waters are typically oligotrophic, it can lead to algal blooms, eutrophication, um, lots of things, things that could be very harmful for coral reefs. And that's what I'm focusing on today. It's also, uh, scientifically speaking, a lot easier for me to source out where the nitrate is coming from. Um, there's a method that I'll talk about briefly coming up, and that's how we determine where the nitrate was coming from. Um, but I just wanted to note what the, the actual concentrations of nitrate were between these three sites, just to give you guys a baseline idea of uh, the, the magnitude of differences. So Black Point, um, here's a nice little chart, was around 10 times higher than what we would consider background level groundwater, which is usually around 17 micromolar here in Hawaii. Um, and so that was around 300 times higher than just background seawater, which is closer to 0.6 micromolar. It's very low. Uh, Wailupe and Kaveikui, this is Kaveikui, was closer to 50 micromolar, so it's still elevated, but not, not even close to what Black Point was. Um, so let's get a better look. I have a couple plots, and I also meant to mention that I don't have these for Kaveikui, but I would imagine they look, I know they look very similar in terms of the salinity plume mixing out with marine water. Um, but in terms of Black Point, the nitrate follows a similar distribution. <coughs> It's highest close to the source and mixes with marine water, which is close to zero. And this plume kind of extends out to the side due to currents. Wailupe has a similar trend to its salinity plume. Um, the nitrate extends out around 150 meters, reaching a concentration of nearly 50 micromolar. Um, so this is another map to to see the nitrate evolution within the Black Point watershed itself. Pololo Tunnel, which was I considered my kind of pristine groundwater end member, was close to 15 micromolar. And then as I got closer to the development and the density, high OSDS density, I started seeing a slight increase in nitrate concentration. And then between Inaco 1 and Black Point, I had a massive jump in nitrate concentration. And so that was really interesting for me as kind of what prompted me to go further and do my nitrate sourcing, which I'll talk about after this. Um, and so 170 micromolars, if that's not a familiar unit for you, it's around 2.4 milligrams per liter. Um, and again, Wailupe was lower, it's around 70 micromolar with Kaveikui Kave being the lowest at 40 micromolar. So those were much more similar to Inacoa 1 or Inacoa 2. So where is this nitrate coming from? I used nitrate stable isotopes to source out the nitrate. And all you really need to know about nitrate stable isotopes is that there are different ranges for different sources. So wastewater has a range from what we call 10 to 20 per mil. And soil nitrogen would have another common range between, say, 4 to 8 per mil. And if you were interested, fertilizers typically around zero. Um, so for Black Point, when I ran all my samples, they all were around 11 per mil. They were within the range for wastewater. Um, you can see that here too. And then between Black Point and Kaveikui, they fell within the range for soil nitrogen. Um, 
Similarly, the wells in the upper Black Point area were much lower and were not within the range for wastewater either, which I can show you on this next plot, coincides with this, this evolution of, of nitrate and stable nitri nitrogen values as you get closer to the coast where the, all the OSDS are located. If you can remember, they're all really concentrated right here. Um, so this led me to use a recharge model that the state of Hawaii and USGS had made to look at the different volumetric contributions of recharge versus wastewater in each watershed. And so what I ended up doing was I branched the Black Point watershed off at Ainakoa 1 to see if there was a higher fraction of wastewater in that lower region versus the upper regions. And indeed, I found that it was around, it, wastewater composed around 16% of uh, total recharge in the lower portion of Black Point compared to, say, 0.7% for all of Wailupe and 0.3% wastewater for all of Kaveikui. Um, so this overlap between the elevated nitrate stable isotope values at Black Point and the high nitrate concentrations and this recharge model really confirmed what I was thinking and that there was wastewater coming out from this. And, you know, the exact percentages, I can't, I can't exactly say, but I do know that they have to be, it has to be within the range of, say, like 2 to 13% based on my model calculations. So... Um, like I said, wastewater is the most likely culprit for the elevated nitrate we see in the Black Point groundwater. Um, I'm working with someone at UH, Craig Nelson, who studies microbial communities, and he's also finding that Black Point's groundwater has, is associated with kind of this unique biome of microbes that we're not finding in the Wailupe groundwater. And he can't speak on the implications of this, so I can't really either. <laughs> but um, there's definitely something unique happening there. We think it's associated with the wastewater. Um, the next steps, really, there's a lot of momentum behind getting cesspools upgraded on Oahu. And so Act 120 was recently passed, which is a cesspool tax credit. And it allows people to upgrade their cesspools to septic systems for 10,000, it's a $10,000 credit. Um, but septic systems may not be the solution after all because they, they rely on having this, this slightly impermeable soil that I don't think the salt can, can provide for treating, treating the wastewater. Um, and to qualify, you have to kind of pass a few formalities. Your cesspool has to be within 200 feet of a wetland stream or the shoreline or within two, a two year travel time to a drinking water source. Um, so when I did just a quick calculation, it looked like many of the cesspools, if not most, um, were outside of this 200 foot delineation in the Black Point area anyways. So um, moving forward, I think the issue is, is still really complicated and it's highly political, but I, now that the research is being done and I think we'll be better equipped to address these issues moving forward. Finally, I'd like to thank my advisor, Dr. Henrietta Dulai, Joseph Fackrell, Robert Whittier, the Safe Drinking Water Branch, Dr. Brian Pope, uh, the SOAS Lab for Analytical Biogeochem, the Stable Isotope Lab, the Coastal Geology Group, and the Thomas Donahue and Nelson Labs. All right. Um, so I think Christina did a great job at sort of prefacing uh, where I'm going with my talk um, on Maui. So what I'm going to kind of get into is the use of drones. Um, and I know there's a lot of bad, bad press out there, um, but they are extremely useful. Um, but first, quick conceptual model. Um, Christina already went over that. So SGD, once again, is just that infiltrated water that picks up whatever sort of land use is going on. And that can then travel down to the coastline where it discharges out. So with that conceptual model in mind, I want you guys, so here we are on Maui. And I'm gonna bring up some of the different uh, aspects that Maui has to deal with. And the first one is uh, probably the most well-known. It's actually the uh, wastewater injection plants. Um, there's Lahaina, Kahului, and Kihei, um, where they actually take the treated wastewater, inject it, 
into the ground uh, near the coastline. And there's also been a, a lot of research done specifically on these areas. But unlike Oahu, there's still a lot that's unknown about the overall extent of groundwater um, discharging around the island of Maui. So, of course, Maui is known for sugarcane. Um, there's also former sugarcane areas over on West Maui. Now, these can still have the potential to contribute nutrients to the uh, groundwater through legacy effects, um, as this all ended in two, uh, 1999. And, of course, we also have pineapple uh, there in yellow. Um, now, that ended in 2009. Um, my pineapple company shut their doors, but once again, there's still that long-term effect from groundwater as it slowly seeps to the coastline. And of course, golf courses there in red. And then one of the big issues that Christina brought up is the OSDS, on-site disposal systems. And so these, this is a map of all OSDS systems on the entire island of Maui. So these are all areas that are basically contributing to excess nutrients in the groundwater. So in the early 90s, uh, Maui began to have these recurring algal blooms where they're basically smothering the reef and eventually these uh, it would wash up along the shore. This is a picture from Kihei and you can see all, all this algae all along the shoreline here that they were having to bulldoze off. Now there's an economic study that was done and it was estimated that about, uh, it was costing Maui County about $20 million a year. And that was all a loss in rental income, decrease in property values, as well as just the cost of cleaning this up. So this led to a lot of research that was going on. Um, so in 97, Switcher and Peterson focused on trying to link ag agricultural practices to elevated nutrients within the actual groundwater. And they, conclusions are a little, like, they were very uh, definitive. And then uh, 2009, Hunt and Rosa really focused on using a whole different uh, bunch of parameters to detect the presence of wastewater discharging into the coastline, specifically around Lahaina and Kihei. And then in 2010, Megan Daler focused on actually mapping the uh, delta 15 in ratios of nitrogen in macroalgae around the entire coastline of uh, Maui, which really kind of set a, a precedence in terms of being able to locate areas that were impacted by humans. And then the infamous Glenn et al. Um, research that really linked the discharge um, through the use of dyes actually to water discharging at Kahikili Beach Park um, on Maui. And so there was a definitive link that was then known to be occurring. So people knew like, okay, nutrients are definitely um, being put in the ground and discharging along the coastline. But there's still that question, like what's, what's the bigger picture? Where is all these areas, because a lot of this was focused on very specific spots. So that's where my research came in. Um, we used a thermal infrared camera located in a plane, and we actually flew around um, the island of Maui. And so the, the benefit of this is just a good large coverage area, and it shows the temperature difference. Now this reveals actually the plume area where these uh, colder groundwater is discharging out into the, um, to the coast and also gives you areas of potential impact. So we flew around in the middle of the night. Um, it was a little sketchy, but it was, it was still fun. And this was our results. We did uh, encounter some clouds, infrared, cannot see through clouds. Um, but this gave us a great sort of uh, regional scale map to be able to step back and look at what's going on uh, within Maui. And now this was done in 2014. And then the goal from here was to actually use a different method which is going to be continuous radon monitoring. Now, this would enable us to actually quantify the amount of groundwater discharging into the coastline. So this also re reveals variations like tidal signatures um, as we do this over the course of an entire tidal cycle. And then uh, we also do nutrient sampling. So what we can do then is we have a, a groundwater flux rate, and we know what the nutrient concentration is of that groundwater. We then can actually determine how much nutrients are discharging into that coastal ecosystem. So there's a few uncertainties with this method. Um, the first one involving the thermal infrared imaging. So it's like you're up in a plane, it's the middle of the night, and you really have no idea what's going to, uh, on down the ground. It is what we're imaging, is that runoff from rain? Um, how are the waves and the uh, impacting sort of that environment that it's discharging into? And also, there's a, a time disconnect between when we're able to do that flight in the airplane and then actually go to Maui and set up and do the radon uh, monitoring. 
along with that, so airplanes, they're expensive to run and the whole weather dependent aspect, you know, there's areas we couldn't actually uh, image. And of course, trying to line everything up so you have an overnight flight coinciding with a low tide. You know, when you're up in the air for five hours at a time, obviously the tidal cycle is changing quite a bit. So you, some areas are going to image like perfect conditions, other areas, the tide's moving in. And so it makes it tricky. So actually earlier this year, we had an opportunity to meet with uh, a crew from Korea. They came over, they brought their drone and they had a thermal infrared camera on it. So they taught me how to fly it. Um, they were making a documentary. And so we took that opportunity to actually go to Maui and, and do a flight. And so at the end of April, we were actually over there and we were able to fly over the Kihei boat ramp. And the cool part about this is you're getting real time imagery of what's going on. So we have this screen right here that we're looking at as it's up in the air flying around. And you can see the, the green color there is actually cold groundwater discharging out of the rocks right here in the corner. And when boats would come and go, you could see how the boats, uh, the motors would stirring things up, push all that cold water back into the harbor. We, that pretty much sold us. So we're like, okay, we got, we got to figure out how we can get uh, this sort of setup. And so we were able to actually get a camera. This uh, is actually relatively small, maybe an inch and a half on each side. And so this, and then this area here, this is actually the data collection system. So it's imaged at nine frames a second and collected right there. And so we mounted this on this drone right here. So you can see the camera right there. We've got an antenna that beams the signal from the camera back down to the ground so we can see what's going on. And so we went to Maui. Um, with the previous flight in mind, we had picked out a bunch of different areas that had some uh, potential for us to look at. But we really narrowed it down to five specific areas that we wanted to look at. Um, so I did this most recent um, data collection uh, beginning uh, what was it? August. And so I'm still kind of processing through this. So I want to show you guys just a little bit of what I've had, I have done so far. So this is Honolulu Bay. So what you can see here, that's our radon time series setup uh, to quantify how much groundwater is discharging out. We also have little temperature buoys that I've made that are set up. So basically they're doing time series temperature logging of the water column. So you get this sort of profile. You can see that there. Now groundwater, it discharges, kind of coincides with the actual uh, tidal signature. So you can see here in blue, this is actual tide. So as it drops, you see that the groundwater in here, this is the actual the rate on that we're measuring, increases quite a bit. And then as the tide starts coming back in, that amount starts leveling off. And you can see that in the imagery as well. This is a, a recon flight that we did, trying to figure out the best place to locate our boat. Um, and there you can see so what, what we have here is actually groundwater discharging out along this cliff face. The darker color is uh, colder water. There's also a stream over here that's discharging out as well. So now I'll compare this to this next uh, slide at high tide. Um, this area right here is basically, it's like barely, you can kind of see the plume. So you can see that variability um, with the imagery. And now, the good part about this is that we can actually quantify what the surface, surface area of, this, of these plumes are. Um, here, I've kind of mapped it out based solely on temperature. Now the goal with this actually take this so we get the surface area and then we use those buoys and then we can actually quantify the depth. So we have a total, we have a volume of water that um, we're able to work with there. And you can see this here. So this Right along here is uh, the shoreline, and then this is so this is distance out from shore, starting here and heading out this way out to that point out there. So th there's our boat set up, and you can see where all this colder groundwater is discharging out. And because it's fresher, it floats on the surface even though it is colder. And so you can see that here in this uh, sort of model, warmer water underneath. Now, um, kind of the next step that we're we're of looking at going with this is comparing surface area to actual discharge rate. And so these are some values from previous research done uh, over on the Kona Coast in Hawaii by uh, Adam Johnson and then Jackie Kelly uh, did some uh, work over at Pearl Harbor. And what they found is that there's a this nice correlation between surface area and then discharge volume. And so what we're going to be testing on Maui is if is there a correlation um, between these areas. 
So let's take a look at Wahikuli. Um, this is one of these areas where we sampled. So this is what uh, one of the spots that we did. This is some imagery from it. And you can see a little right here, this is kind of the groundwater discharging out. Over here, you see where the boat is. And so this is that plume that we're imaging right here. Now this is the airplane-based regional uh, scale TIR that we're looking at here. So if we can take this uh, calculations that we get here and actually apply it to this whole stretch of coastline, we can get a better idea sort of upscaling from one small spot to a much larger area without having to sample each individual spot. Um, so that's kind of the goal that we're hoping to go with that. So it's just uh, simply surface area to discharge rate and then having those nutrient samples that we can then correlate how much uh, nutri excess nutrients are discharging to the coastline. So in conclusion, um, airplane-based TR is an excellent regional scale tool uh, to use at, to try and find well, like, what's the big picture. And then UAVs or drones, they're so much cheaper. And I got to say, I feel way safer standing on the ground flying it as opposed to being in this plane right here in the middle of the night flying around. Um, so that, that's a huge bonus for us. And then the combination of, so the, the UAV with the, the real-time assessment, we actually find out specific spots. And then the, actually combining the two, the radon with the TIR um, to potentially use to upscale our findings to other locations. So like that. All right, thank you guys for coming. Um, now for something a little bit different. All right, so today I'm going to be talking to you guys about our hydrologic flow model that models the narrowing of the space between the surface and groundwater as sea level rises, as well as what areas will flood, so groundwater inundation. So here's our study area. This is looking across Kaka'ako and Waikiki towards Diamond Head, and this is the economic engine of the state of Hawaii. Um, and it's generally agreed upon that by 2050, we should expect about a third of a meter of sea level rise, and by 2100, one meter of sea level rise. Okay, so as sea level rises, we're going to get flooding from water coming up and over the coastline, as well as water coming up and through the surface. So there's this big body of water down there that's going to be lifted as sea level rises, and it's it's going to produce these inland wetlands, and it's going to narrow the space between the surface and groundwater level, which we call accommodation space. Okay, so just remember that term. So you guys have seen this a couple times today. This is our aquifer in Oahu. So it's a general lens system, and along the coastline here, there's this layer right here that caps it. It's called cap rock, and it's less permeable. So it doesn't allow water to flow through as quickly, and it allows this lens to build up a little bit thicker and closer to the surface. And this image really illustrates it. This is back in 1920. This is Western Waikiki. What you see here, this is an aerial image showing uh, wetlands that have been cultivated into rice paddies. And so when they dredged the alawai in the mid-20s, they took that dredge material as well as dredge material from along the coastlines here, and they filled the land with it. And so in a lot of areas across Kaka'ako and Waikiki, the, the accommodation space is only as thick as that fill layer. And to illustrate this a little further, Western Waikiki, well, this is a pit showing that there's about a meter of distance between the surface of the sidewalk and groundwater level. But this image was taken when the tide level was nine centimeters below mean sea level. Okay, so at mean sea level, you could expect the groundwater level to be here at this red arrow. And at high tide, you can expect it to be here at this yellow arrow. And the sidewalk isn't really representative of the ground surface, so you could see where the ground, ground arrow is. So there's only about a third of a meter of accommodation space at this location currently. And that accommodation space is really valuable because this is where our underground infrastructure is. Like you see these white pipes, these are PVC pipes underground. So some of this in underground infrastructure has been designed to be submerged and some of it hasn't. 
Okay, and we've talked about cesspools today. So there has to be at least a meter of accommodation space for cesspools to work, for them to filter raw sewage. Um, so these are the number of cesspools across our study area. And another reason why accommodation space is so valuable is because um, there's only so many pore spaces that fill up as rainfall as it rains. So when it rains, it floods. This is on that same property. This is about two blocks away during a different event. And this is over on the east side of Waikiki. That's the Honolulu Zoo. All right, so this shows the frequency at which it floods now. So as sea level rises, it's only going to become more chronic, this flooding. So with our study, we have two questions. How much does groundwater vary with the, with the ocean, as the ocean varies, as the ocean surface varies? And our second question is, as sea level rises, how thin will that accommodation space get? And how much flooding can we expect and where? So first, I'm going to answer this question with methods and results, then I'll answer this question with methods and results. So first, um, to answer our first question, we installed um, monitoring devices, one that monitors barometric pressure and another that monitors groundwater level that's corrected for barometric pressure. And everything is referenced to elevation because elevation is referenced to mean sea level. So our groundwater heights are referenced to mean sea level. So we installed these devices in four locations. We're going to look at this one. Okay. So this is across a day. It's a Honolulu tide cycle. That's a semi-diurnal tide cycle. So we have a high and a low high tide. You can see how groundwater is influenced. OK, so tidal efficiency, remember this term now. It's the ratio of the height of groundwater that amplitude difference versus the height of this tidal difference. Okay, so it's just a ratio that shows us how much groundwater is influenced by oscillations in the ocean surface. Here's a, a record over six months. Here's rainfall. You can see that during heavy rainfall events, it does influence groundwater. Okay, and we know that short-term variations in the sea surface, such as tides, don't influence groundwater as far into the aquifer as long-term oscillations, such as seasonal changes. And an even longer-term oscillation would be something like sea level rise, okay? So we, we would expect that efficiency would be higher um, during these long-term oscillations. So to test that, we smoothed out the Honolulu tide we smoothed out groundwater, or yeah, groundwater. And you can see that they match each other pretty well. And there's a 97% efficiency. So what this means is as, as sea level rises, you can expect groundwater to rise by the same amount and basically instantaneously. Okay? So we've answered our first question. We can, yeah, as sea level rises, groundwater is going to rise by the same amount. So now we're answering our second question, okay? And we do this through modeling. And we use a modeling program that was designed by the USGS. It allows users to build a grid such as this one that has different geologies, so water flows um, faster or slower through each of these. Um, and in the grid, it solves flow equations. And what it gives you is a height of groundwater above mean sea level or whatever datum you choose. So let's build a model. Oh yeah, there's Dwight. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is the conceptual model that we're that we want to model, that we want to simulate. So we've got layer one here, layer two. We've got some wells that have been installed throughout the study area. Um, there's flow in from the ocean and from layer two to layer one. All right, so this is our surface of layer one. We just take elevations from onshore and offshore. We bring in contours, which represents the surface of layer two, right here. 
we bring in different parameters from a regional flow model that was built by the Department of Health and the Groundwater Resource Research Center. And that includes rainfall, geology, wells, and well pumping rates. And along the coastline, we assign a groundwater elevation of zero. We populate the model with different observation points, including our four continuous wells, as well as single point water levels that we've corrected for the tide. Those are from Department of Health records. And we use those um, to kind of make sure the model's right. We, we change flux into the model from the mountains and also up through the surface. So we calibrate our model by making sure that these water levels that we have here um, match observed. And then in order to simulate sea level rise, we just change the groundwater, or we change the water elevation along the coastline by whatever increment that we want to model. So we're gonna model a third of a meter, two thirds of a meter, and a meter. And the way that we get flood maps is, okay, we get our model grid. And so the grid represents elevations of groundwater above mean sea level. And at all these observation points, you can see error bars here. And all these blue dots represent where there's flooding. And offshore, it correctly models the ocean. And it also correctly models the OLI. So we subtract that grid from a digital elevation model. So we just take elevation data and we connect the dots and make a surface. So this minus this equals our flood map. So this represents current conditions um, at mean high, high water, so at high tide and no rain. So or an average amount of rain. And so um, the blues represent where there's flooding. So dark blue is where there's more, more than a half a meter of flooding. Light blue is where there's zero to a half a meter of flooding. So you can see this model correctly simulates the Duke Kahanamoku Lagoon here, a water feature over in the park, and in the municipal golf course, there's little water features and stuff. And what the red and the yellow represent, those are dry areas, but they're places where the accommodation space is zero to a half a meter under, uh, you have zero to a half a meter of accommodation space where it's red, and a half a meter to a meter where it's yellow, okay? So if we, if this model is really accurate, we would expect that in these pink areas, there would be flooding during heavy rainfall events, which there is. And over at the mall, it's hard to see, but this car is parked in a big puddle. Okay, so then we raise sea level by a third of a meter. Again, this is probably what we can expect for 2050. And there's a lot more flooding over at the mall, a lot more flooding over here in the municipal golf course. Um, two thirds of a meter. It's a lot more flooding back here. Those rice paddies from the past are starting to reemerge. The, <laughs> the Alawai is starting to flood. Um, and there's a lot of streets that are beginning to flood, so it's going to impede traffic. Here's a meter. Okay, so again, this dark blue is where we have deeper flooding of half a meter to a meter. So that's not going to be used by golfers very much in the future. Um, and a lot of these transportation corridors. We find that with this much flooding, 60 kilometers of roadway is inundated and 2,000 structures. So, in conclusion, we've answered our first question. <laughs> As sea level rises, groundwater too will rise pretty much by the same amount and at the same time. Question two, we've looked at places across our study area, seeing which areas are at risk, or which areas will flood first. Um, and in the future, we plan to take this model and implement it in different places around Oahu. Okay, so with that, I thank you.
have the speakers just stand up here next to the podium and we'll open the floor to no. Yeah. Um, so are you familiar? I, I came last weekend. Have you, you know, are you familiar with the work that uh, Flora Beth did? Mm -hmm. How does your research differ from what she's doing? I, I, I believe it's primarily your concentration on the private sewage systems in yeah. the Bay Area versus hers would be, would it be more, is there any association? We work in the same group. And yeah. so my efforts were done for she's kind of filling in the gaps now. Okay. Um, my understanding of where she's at, and this could be different from what she presented because I haven't talked to her recently, yeah. is that she's she's primarily focused on algae and how the algae are reacting to this elevated nutrient content at Black Point versus Guadalupe. Um, so her focus is on the benthic benthic productivity, and I'm looking at overall geochemistry, the evolution of the signature the magnitude of groundwater coming out. Um, there's a lot of stuff that wasn't maybe presented. No. Yeah, so my, I guess my question is, so in regards to her work, would it be fair to say that, is there more association with surface, like non-point source pollution, groundwater runoff, that might be pertaining to her work versus yours, which is primarily relating to a subterranean, you know, groundwater runoff being uh, affected by these cesspools and things such as that? Or not, you know? I'm not sure what you... Yeah, I guess I'm just trying to draw where you get, you know, if you, when you make your, when you take your measurements on these nitrate levels, and yeah. things, it, is there any risk of your readings being flawed by surface water runoff also occurring? Oh, um, no, I mean, the times I sampled, there was no rainfall event. There are, like, honestly, if you look back to USGS reports dating to, like, 1910, um, stream inputs in that particular, all of those watersheds are really negligible year-round they only flow during these major rainfall events and i was actually out sampling back in september when we had three days of rain and even the drainages there weren't flowing after that it takes a lot of rain um, and it's really easy easy for us to know if the the rainfall is affecting our measurements because we'll see salinity anomalies that we wouldn't normally see um, instead with my nutrient data we get these nice relationships between the groundwater end member and the marine end member and they line up to what we would expect, is the simplest way to put it. Yeah. I didn't know there were so many cesspools still in service. I thought there almost everybody. Was yeah. Shooting. Hawaii's got the highest highest Black amount point. of OSDS in, in the nation. Black Point is a, is a major coral outcrop, really. So it would be very porous. There's stuff coming down. It would probably be able to seep through that rock much quicker yeah. and get the, it. Yeah. The main boil there is a lava tube. Yeah. So. Versus the areas in places like that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Let's talk about black points. Okay. Uh, the cesspools. I, I thought that the landowners are under a lot of pressure to go down environmental to do something about the cesspools. No? Um, as my interactions with the landowners in that area are limited. Um, I'm not even sure they're all, I mean, they have to be aware that they have cesspools because. <laughs> Their properties on the their parcels are obviously being their wastewater is going somewhere. Um, I haven't. This is actually the first time even I've even presented these results since I just published them, and I knew they would probably be a little controversial. Um, I don't really get involved in the politics, and uh, Department of Health they're working on getting policies in place to help people upgrade. Um, I. I I can just present the science and let the public decide on what they want to do with it. I would presume the nature of the Black Point area, because of its rocky subterranean mm -hmm. nature, would be, and logistics is so tight out there for them to put in a private, a, a public sewage system like you have in other neighborhoods. Or it'd be costly and hard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it'd be much more expensive. Yeah. Sure. yeah. And so I guess that's probably the primary economic reason why it never occurred up there. Yeah, because I mean, the, the, nature OSG of the, is, the nature of the geology on Black There are tons of places, I'm sure, on Oahu where the same thing's happening and yeah. we're yet to show it, but. Oh, it's definitely on the Bay. Yeah. There's an awful lot of more often on the mm -hmm. a variety of schools, including the taking out of people. Um, yeah. Uh, bacteria. 
Yeah, the microbial work that Craig Nelson is doing is really interesting, and I'm excited to see where that goes. His, uh, his preliminary data shows that the communities are different than what you would expect for, I don't even know if I should be sharing this, but they're different than what you sh would expect for wastewater, say, on the mainland. The EPA has established these, like, enterococci and staph that are typical for wastewater in these um, <laughs> indicators, but in Hawaii, the systems are different, and so we're not finding those, but we are finding very different bacteria than where we don't have that wastewater input. <clears throat> Have you looked at any other uh, hyperspectral cameras to look at some of what's happening? No, like basically, I mean, thermal is sort of the default method just to detect the temperature differences. Um, that's kind of where we're at now. And even that in itself is the technology, it's still not to the point where it's uh, affordable. You know, the, the cameras are. The, the one we used was close to 12 grand, uh, just for the camera. So um, some of the other hyperspectral stuff that's out there, uh, I don't know how it necessarily would be applied, and it'd probably be even more expensive. It would be more expensive. Like what specifically uh, did you have in mind? Well, I, I did some work with hyperspectral a number of years ago. Yeah, and that's I think where a lot of the hyperspectral stuff ends up going is just satellites because of the amount of coverage that they can get. It's all the yeah. yeah. But they're also uh, government has I, I mean, yeah, that, that it's area. it's a kind of a, a different area, so I, I haven't had a lot of exposure to it. I'm familiar with it and how it's used. Um, you know, I mean, basically, you're going to be able to determine like chlorophyll content and stuff like that more than anything. So that's one of the uses I think they would use hyperspectral. And then it's still tricky trying to figure out. Okay, you get these. Uh, Basically, like profiles, so, you know, from different, you know, each individual little uh, wavelength band is going to give you a slightly different um, return, and so they use different libraries to determine, okay, what's actually in there, and so, I'm, yeah, I'm not haven't really looked into that necessarily and how that would be used for just determining. Might be a long term suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I know that part, but it's interesting because a lot of our um, digital cameras, you know, the filter you have can pick up some of that that we don't. Realize that the cameras actually see. Yeah. I'm surprised your research hasn't been done before. Right. Yeah, and, and everybody should be up in arms and going, okay, why are we letting development continue? There was a study that was done about maybe two years ago now that it was the same study area. It was a one-dimensional model. So this is actually continuing that research and trying to get, uh, trying to do it better. Yeah, trying to get more realistic results. Um, yeah, so it has been done. People freaked out. It was on the front page of the paper one day. Um, so, and, and people are starting to do it more in other places, like they've done it in Florida, they've done a couple of reports on it, and they did some in Chesa Chesapeake Bay. So it's gaining ground, gaining momentum, and I think, yeah, I think it, it needs to be 
people are going to recognize that we're we're feeling we're experiencing sea the impacts of sea level rise currently, and it's only like flooding is only going to be more frequent and storms like Superstorm Sandy that totally flooded New York. Um, like things like that will happen more and more frequently as there's not enough inundation space. Yeah. Yeah. I think as these terrible things like Superstorm Sandy and Katrina and these things start happening and there's a lot of fires that are burning in California now because there's a huge drought. Like climate change is really, people are seeing it now and people are taking it more seriously. And so, yeah, I don't know, I'm hopeful that people will come around. They are, they are coming around. The Congress that wants to let scientists be scientists. Uh, regarding the uh, sea level events, you have a monitoring well the blue stations, continuous yes. monitoring well. What's the lag time between actual high rise and high, high tide and high wind or reflection of the It's a little it's a little bit more than um, an hour. An hour? Yeah. Just an hour. Mm -hmm. And also um, interesting thing about the police station is um, they have a lot of garage space underground and that's already flooding and it doesn't have anything to do with the tide, the state of the tide, how much rainfall there's been, but they're really curious what's going on because it's really expensive to seal basements and people are going to have more and more trouble sealing their basements and you're going to experience this flooding. Any other questions?